Just stop using, they say. Why can't we just do that? How come it's not that simple? It's not that simple for a couple reasons. Our pleasure comes from our dopamine. When you have an addiction, it takes the place of that dopamine. So if you're constantly saying to your brain, I don't need your dopamine, I have my own, that part of your brain says, fine, I'm not going to produce it. If you're going to get it from alcohol or drugs or wherever you're going to get it from, I'm not making it no more. You're on your own. So when we deplete that, the brain will no longer make it. It decides it's not going to make it. Then the only option we have is our addiction in order to maintain what we consider our happy. Welcome back. And today we get to speak to a certified transformational life coach for women with over 20 years of experience. Just to start out, she has a master's in psychology, a major in mental health, and a minor in addiction. Now that barely starts her list of accomplishments. Um, she is also a recovering alcoholic that survived a car crash that broke 75% of the bones in her body and took her memory. Um, she gives us a really honest and open episode, talks about regrets with her family and things. This is a really good episode, especially for the ladies. Um, I appreciate you guys being here, supporting this small little channel. Likes and shares and, and comments and things like that really help me out. So if you could do that, that would be so much appreciated. I hope I earn those things from you. And without further ado, sit back and relax and enjoy this episode of Chopping It Up. Christina. Jamie. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you for having me. Yeah. So you look darling. <laughs> well, I, thank you. I like you. your shirt. And it's crazy because today's Eclipse Day, right? We was just talking about the Eclipse. Eclipse Day. And it makes people drive really slow and ride their brakes. <laughs> <laughs> makes the whole world go crazy. <laughs> yes, huh? it does. Um, so well, thanks for coming, man. I appreciate you coming. And I didn't even know that your story went back as far as it did until a few minutes ago, right? It does. Like, we've known each other for a while, but uh, I had no idea of your history. And when I started asking, I was like, hold on. <laughs> hold on. Let me turn everything on real quick, right? <laughs> so introduce yourself, man. Tell us a little bit about you. You know, how old you are, where you're from. So Christina Cook. I am 54, but, you know, 29 plus shipping and handling sounds a okay. whole lot better at 54. Uh, originally from the Winchester area. Grew up here, spent my summers in Tennessee where my family is. You're going to hear the accent come out every now and again, so okay, bear with me. <laughs> That's okay. I, I spent some time in Tennessee, too. I, I picked it up when I was there for like two months. My mom hated it. Love it. Love it. Um, I am a personal development and self-care life coach for women. Uh, okay. Been doing it 15 years uh, pro bono for a long time. Um, and the, the why is going to be a little uncomfortable because um, I've, I've never really went that far back, okay. especially since the accident. Um Lost a lot of my memory 20 years ago in that car accident. Okay, so where do you want to start? You want to start? What's most interesting for you? You want to start sure, in your childhood? Let's, <clears throat> let's start with the uh, why Okay. I became a life coach. So, you know, everybody in their 20s, we I did the party thing, the drink. I was, okay, this is the part you like to brag about in your 20s. I could drink anybody under the table. From 20 to 30, there was not an alcoholic beverage that I couldn't drink that just, it didn't do anything. So I could just drink it. And I liked it. Not gonna lie. Um, so 20s, that's all I did. I drank. That, okay. That was. So it all starts with alcohol? All started with alcohol. Okay. Nothing in your teenage years. Uh, yeah, 15, you know, I was the bartender for my dad Okay. at 15, and from there, I figured, you know, everything you make, you got to taste, so at 15, I was tasting it to make sure it was made right, uh -huh. and from there, it just, it became a thing. It was, it was my choice. Nobody knew if you were drinking and... You know, your parents drank, so you could get away with it. Nobody noticed. And back mm -hmm. in that day, you know, parents said, well, as long as you drink, 
when you're at home, it's okay. Mm-hmm. So I did. <laughs> hey, my dad told me I could start smoking. I definitely started smoking more. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I carried that all the way through to my 20s. Got into some trouble. You know, did some things that shouldn't have been doing. You know, late nights, not coming home, disappearing, that kind of thing. Typical teenage stuff, though, right? I mean, this is typical early 20s. Yeah. You know, everybody was doing it. You get off work, 11 o'clock at night, you stay out and party and drink till 2 or 3 and hope to God you got from where you were home Mm -hmm. safely. Um, Don't remember a a lot of it, but... We didn't do a lot of Ubering. No, no Ubering. Yeah. Nope. You, You drove and hoped you made it. So... Yeah, that's that's kind of where my So from started. around here, like where were you partying now? What was there certain bars you went to? Rainbow Road, Piggies, any place like that? <sighs> no place in particular. Any place that would let us get in and and you know back in that day, it was all fields. You, you went to somebody's house and pulled into a field and field parties. All the trucks parties. and then you just sat there and drank until you, you couldn't huh. anymore. Yeah, I do remember field mm-hmm. parties. Be lucky to find some place there where you could just go out and have a good time. Yep. No cops to bother you. Right. No neighbors. And we would just party. All okay. Night. And that lasts how long? How long is just, I mean, you're maintaining though, right? Are you working? Like oh, how, yeah. How's life other than the drinking? Other than that, I was a functioning alcoholic. Mm-hmm. I would, I was addicted to work. That's how I grew up. You didn't do anything but work. Um, so I, I was a functioning alcoholic. I never missed work. I'd work eight, 12, 16 hours a day. I was the one that when I got off work, first thing I did, I walked in, I threw my stuff down, grab a bottle of beer and drank until I was passed out and get up the next day, go to work, no hangover, no nothing. Hmm. So for me to not have a hangover, it was like... <laughs> Yeah, I can do this again today. Right. No consequence <laughs> means I'm so just going to keep doing what yep. I'm doing. Yeah. So that's what I did. Hit, you know, 30, slowed down a little bit, not a whole lot. Even at 30, still functioning alcoholic. And you know, my dad was an alcoholic. Um, and I always said, well, yeah, I'm just like my dad. And I thought that was a good thing. So. I didn't see anything wrong with it. Right. I, I figured my, you know, my dad worked. He was a functioning alcoholic. If he could do it, I could do it. Mm-hmm. So I just, I kept on right up, right up until my 30s. Um, in my 30s, I had my car accident. Um, in the beginning, my drinking was a social thing. It was an age thing. I didn't really need, I really didn't need it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I could quit whenever I wanted. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Same scenario. Hit my 30s. um, Had a couple mental spells. Had some breakdowns. Uh, Depression hit me really hard. And then manic hit me really hard. And went and saw a doctor. And they told me I had bipolar disorder. Okay, I didn't know that was a thing. <laughs> we so, weren't we weren't diagnosed with all this mm-mm. stuff coming up either, right? Like we don't I don't remember a bunch nope. of kids being all these things that they call kids now. Like we nope. didn't have that stuff. There was there was no such thing. Mm-hmm. When I went home and told my family, they were and that's just it. When I told my family, it was yeah that no that's not possible. You know that's it's not a thing. I got anxiety. Uh, that's not a thing either. Okay, well, you know, you, you keep it to yourself if it's not a thing. Mm-hmm. So I continued to self-medicate. You know, the doc, doctor put me on medication, didn't work. Still kept drinking because drinking, it, that worked. <laughs> at least I thought it worked. Right, well, it numbed the pain for temporarily at yeah. least. Yeah, I mean, I could do anything. I didn't have anxiety when I was drinking, you know. A little, little more depressed, but I was a happy depressed person right. <laughs> wasn't a sad one so i self-medicated for a long time long time 
tried to do the meds, you know, and they, and they tell you not to drink when you're taking certain medications for bipolar disorder. But I thought I could. <laughs> so I did. Um, got to a point where I was more depressed than I was happy. And couldn't figure out why, you know. Mm -hmm. I just figured the medication wasn't strong enough. Could no way, there's no way in hell it was the alcohol. <laughs> right. I've been functioning way too long. <laughs> right. Been doing fine all this time. I just added these pills, so it has to be the pill. Has to be the pill. Has to be. Um. Car accident. They put me on more medication, which you know really didn't help. Because it was a lot of pain medications. Uh -huh. And I needed those. Um, I broke 75% of the bones in my body. Okay, so let's talk about that. What happened there? Whew. Um, got hit head on about five seconds from my house. Oh, shit. Um, young lady tried to pass somebody. And we topped the hill at the same time. She was in a little car, and I was in a Dodge Durango. Only thing that saved my life. Um, she wasn't as lucky, unfortunately, because she had a small baby. Um, thank God the baby wasn't with her. Um, but literally five seconds from my house, my husband heard it from where he was at on the porch. Um, completely demolished the Durango. <clears throat> it literally broke everything. Um, severe concussion from where the steering wheel hit me in the face. Mm -hmm. So no airbag? The airbag deployed, but from the angle that she hit me, it came back and came up and hit me right here. Uh -huh. So it shattered my teeth, broke my jaws. Uh. Um, baby food is a wonderful thing. <laughs> Do a straw. So I mean, seatbelt on though, right? Seatbelt. Saved my life. Okay. Um. So I was grateful for that. Um, funny story. I don't remember a whole lot of it. Um, I, I do remember being in the hospital and looking at my youngest sister and saying, did I break any nails? And she said, no, you didn't break any. Hmm. I was like, oh, thank God. She said, however, your teeth are missing. Wow. I was like, oh, man. And back out I went. Right. Right, we just wake up with this crazy little thought, like a dream almost, yeah. huh? Yeah. All of it. To me, the entire hotel or the entire hospital stay was a dream because I don't remember any of it. Right. Um, it what was, you remember of it's probably the things people have told you. Yes. Um, for as hard as I was hit, I do not have, uh, I'd probably say I lost about 80% of my memory of anything before the accident. Oh, shit. So it, that was the hardest part. You know, the, it, broken bones, not being able to walk, being in a wheelchair for almost a year. That was hard physically because it made me violent. Uh -huh. I, was, I was very violent because I still didn't stop drinking. I needed that coping me mechanism. Okay. And that, that was my comfort zone. So like in the hospital, you're getting you're getting alcohol to you in the hospital. No, they didn't bring me any in the hospital. Um, I was there for. My husband says I was there for two weeks. Uh -huh. um, I I really can't tell right. you how long I was there. Right. Um, but you don't remember any of that, like, nothing. and then like you remember the day you come home, or I remember the day coming home. Um, and you're broke up. Seventy five percent of your body. So what? Like you're talking collarbone, neck, back, legs, arm. All of it. Okay. Um, my foot, my right foot was completely crushed. They rebuilt it um, with plastic and bone and uh -huh. metal rods. So I've got no pivot or anything in my in my foot. Um, both shins, both hands, collarbones, all my ribs. I slept in a recliner for over a year. Um, broke my jaw, teeth. Uh, everything it was i couldn't do anything i i couldn't even do anything as simple as hold my hands up to brush my hair right god yeah and you're like that in like a you're in a cast right a lot of you's in a cast yes, yes. 
I had casts on my hands, you know, from here down. Wheelchair is was my transportation. My husband re my husband and his brothers, God bless them, redid the house, put ramps on the front so that they could wheel me in and out when I had to go to the doctor right. every other day. Right. <clears throat> but yeah, it was so this is ugly. So now they're throwing a bunch of opiates at you, right? What do they put you on? Oh, they put me on everything. They put me on oxys. Um, they put me on tramadol. They put me on hydros. <clears throat> Anything imaginable. And then on top of it, um, I was taking my bipolar medications. Um, and then they started a new one that kept me from dreaming because hmm. I couldn't sleep. I would wake up from nightmares mm, trauma so i couldn't always remember them but they would keep me up at night and i'd, I'd wake out wake up sweat hmm. crying so they just added medications so that i wouldn't dream i'd just sleep through the night and some of those were i remember getting up in the middle of the night one night and uh all, all i all i remember is i try to get up and the next thing I know, I'm laying on the floor where I've hit the wall trying to get out of the bed. Heavily medicated. And I, and I was still drinking on top of all of it. Mm -hmm. So I couldn't function. And I was angry, like destructive angry. Um, my husband has replaced, well, he had replaced walls in our houses um, doors. I broke all my glass dishes in my cabinet because I couldn't reach one. Um, so now we eat off plastic. <laughs> hmm. So you just would, like, one thing goes bad and you just couldn't deal with mm -hmm. situations and you would kirk out violently, huh? Yes. To, to the point where everything would just go black. Um, I would go out. We had a, a huge dog house and I, Whenever I would get to a point where I was angry, I would just go out and hit it until either I could see straight or I noticed that my hands were bleeding so bad that I should probably go in and do something. <laughs> Is this more so when you're drunk or more so when you're getting drunk? Like, you know, there, are you drunk all the time? Or I'm not. I wasn't drunk all the time because I was heavily medicated. Right. But I still had to have the alcohol. Mm -hmm. That. That became my coping mechanism because that, that was my comfort zone. Um, but the alcohol had a lot to do with it because when I get when I would get angry, I would drink because what I was trying to do was I was trying to bring myself down mm -hmm. so that because I knew I was destructive. Mm -hmm. So I would drink to calm myself down and it didn't always work. So alcohol. Sometimes you would end up in like a blackout, right? Yes. Like eventually you're in a blackout drunk, beating on the building out back till your hands are bloody. Yep. Yeah. But you're thinking the whole time that this alcohol is going to help the situation. Mm -hmm. That, that was my keeps thought telling process. You that. Yeah. You, you drink more, you'll stop doing this. And it didn't. I, I drank more and, you know, I, I could go to the point where... I could break every bone in my hand, and once I calmed down, even at that point, because I was still drinking, I was numb. Hmm. You know, wash it off, wrap it up, go again. Right, get another beer. Yep. And that well, what did you like drinking? Was it beer? Was it was it beer? Liquor? Beer all the time. Yep. How many? How much beer would you drink in a day? Oh, good lord. Huh? Depending on the day. Um, I'd start with a six pack. And if it was early in the day, I could go another six pack, depending on what time it was. It it just didn't put me to sleep. I could just go and go and go. It was almost like it did the reverse. Hmm. Instead of making me tired, it wired me up. And no hangovers. Like you're never feeling bad. You're never getting up throwing up or no. any of those things in the mornings. No hangovers. Wow, it's amazing how your body just, uh, like, you know, was allowing that to happen. My grandfather drank for his whole life from 13 years to 62. Every time I stayed with him, he got up in the morning and threw up every day of his life. 
He finished his work off with a bunch of liquor. He woke up in the mornings puking before work every single day. So it's like weird. His body never got used to it, but your body was just like, hey, dude, I like this here. I'm not even going to give you too many consequences. Nope. And my dad was the same way, and he was a liquor drinker. And he could drink from the time he got up, time he went to bed, and he never got sick. It's crazy, right? So there were no consequences. Right. That again, that's what I that's kind of my point is because the consequences of alcohol for me at a very young age was I felt really bad for two days. I didn't start drinking any kind of beer till I was in my thirties. And even now I only drink one or two. I don't drink enough to ever have a hangover because I hate that feeling. Mm -hmm. But if I didn't have that feeling when I was younger, I can only imagine how much more I would have drank. Yeah. No consequences. No headaches, no hangovers. I didn't get sick. Nothing. Huh. It's like drinking water. It's crazy. For me. So, you know, I, I did that forever. And after that accident, it just made it worse. Because now I had no memories. You know, and I, and I had a daughter. Ten years old at the time of the accident. And at ten years old, she was giving me a bath, combing my hair, feeding me. Mm-hmm. It, it was, you know, for a mom, that's embarrassing. And you, this is, this is after you had healed. Yeah, it was, it was in the process. Okay. Um, Cause I but, feel like when you were unable to take care of yourself, you needed help, right? Yes. But then you got to the point that you didn't need it and you just allowed it to continue to happen. Is that what you're saying? I did. Okay. I did. Um, because I, I was in that self pity stage mm -hmm. where I didn't want to do it. I, people been doing it for me. I, I right. didn't want to do it. Why, why change the habit that's been the easiest one? And at that point, I didn't care. You know, I, I didn't care to go get in the shower. I didn't care to do something with my hair. My hair was down to my butt. Right. So. Right. Obviously, you don't like it that way. Just throw it up there and go. So hmm. it, it just didn't. Never Do you think that was like the was that depression kicking in stronger? Like you just felt really low, like mm -hmm. didn't care if you were clean, didn't care if I didn't. I was so depressed at the fact that I had no memory of Anna's childhood that I was unable to do for myself anymore. Um I I couldn't be active, you know. I couldn't work 8, 10, 12 hours, so I didn't have anything to keep my mind busy. Mm -hmm. All I could do was sit there. So and somebody that was used bad. to working all the time, you've been working your whole life. Like you whole said, life. you was taught to do that. So your brain's going crazy. Yep. You're not getting anything satisfaction from work or anything. So it's just more alcohol, more pills. Yep. See, that's the only way I could get away from it. And if I didn't take it, you know, depression would get worse or manic would kick in. There's some pluses and some minuses to manic. Mm -hmm. Mild manic is a wonderful thing. <laughs> you can clean house in four hours, and it can be a big house. Okay. You can do anything you want. It, it's almost like you're invincible, and there is nothing you can't get done. Uh, you've got energy where I wouldn't have to sleep two, three days. I could go with no sleep. And I could get so much stuff done. <laughs> so I didn't mind that part. Hmm. It's like a switch kicked on. It's like yeah. a, a change in how you feel. Yes. I am um, what they call rapid cycle. Okay. So I could be sitting there and be completely depressed and three hours later go into a manic episode and go for three days with no sleep. And during these manic, uh, manic episodes, it's like, how are you feeling then? invincible okay you in those stages you are com you feel completely invincible there's nothing you can't do you know I, in my mind i could have been the president of the united states mm -hmm. during those stages um strength uh, that's one of the drawbacks because when you have anger issues and you hit manic you're a little stronger mm. So the damage is a little more intense. 
That's usually when I would. So at the same time, when you're feeling like you're on top of the world and everything's great, there's still that anger that can mm. push you off the side. Oh, yes. Yes. Okay. Angry to the point where my doctor told me the only way to slow my brain down was to wear my body out. So along the back of my house, there is a path. It's a really long path. And he said, walk until you cannot walk anymore. And I would be out there for hours walking back and forth. And that's what I did. It didn't matter. It could be midnight outside walking that path hmm. until my body was exhausted. That's the only way I get rid of it. That's crazy, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so now you're you're healing back, right? So you're starting to feel better as far as your body's healing, mm -hmm. right? But you're still not right in your head. Mm -mm. And then where is things going from here? So where are you at? How old are you at this point? I am probably around 35, okay. 36, somewhere around in there. And Anna is young. And Anna's your only child, right? Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, I hit... When you have bipolar disorder, if you're well medicated, you believe that you don't need your medication. Mm -hmm. So I decided one day I didn't need my medication. I had, I still had alcohol. <laughs> didn't need medication. Um, two weeks in, my brain said, you need medication. And it started to shut down. And I went into full-blown depression. Bad. I even sat in the middle of the bed one night and tried calling that suicide hotline. Mm -hmm. I hope it works better now than it did then. Because all it did was make me angry. Trying to talk to somebody when they're reading from a script. And I had already started my psychology degree, working on my psychology degree. Uh, what else was I going to do? I couldn't work. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it was anti antagonizing to listen to the person on the other end of the phone. So I hung up, went outside, hit the dog box several times. Came back in a couple days later, my sister come and got me because I hadn't, I hadn't left the house. Didn't want to shower. Didn't want to do anything. She come and got me, made me shower. She said, come on, we're going to town. Fine. Threw my hair up. Pulling out of the bank. And I I lost it. I got to bawling. I didn't want to be in the vehicle. My legs hurt. I'm crying. And she, she looked at me. She said, you think we should take you to the hospital? And I said, why? And she said, Chrissy, you've been crying for almost two hours. I had lost track of time. So she, I said, yeah, take me. At this point, I'd, I'd given up. So she took me and, you know, I sat in there and they did the whole, you know, how are you feeling? Are you going to commit suicide? Are you going to hurt somebody else? And. I am four years into my degree, my psychology degree. And that part of my brain kicked in. And I started to answer the questions and I was lying through my teeth. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Another girl comes in and my husband comes in and she's asking him some questions. And he is staring at me like, stop lying to her. There's, it's not right. So she said, would you be willing to stay? I said, sure, I'll stay. Okay, she didn't tell me how long I had to stay. Because mm -hmm. had she told me, I wouldn't have stayed. <laughs> how long was it? <laughs> Two weeks. Okay. Um. And I really hope it's gotten better. Because it was horrible. I, it was horrible you know they 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 strip you down take you in a wheelchair into the psych ward 
and with a security guard. They walk behind you. Um, and then take you into a locked facility. Your family can't even go with you at all. And they put you in the center of a room with all these other people and go through your intake. And, and all of these people are listening to you and you are sitting there with hardly nothing on. Um, I've never been to jail, but in a psych ward, it's you have to earn everything, like everything. Your clothes, because they don't know what you could try to hang yourself with or mm -hmm. strangle yourself. So they literally take everything from you. Um, you can't shower by yourself. You can't go to the bathroom by yourself. Somebody stands and makes sure you take your medications. Um, everybody eats together. They watch you eat to make sure you're not taking anything out. Your silverware. Make sure you're eating all your fruits and vegetables. And for two weeks. And it's a horrible place. And like I said, they don't, you can't have visitors. Um, not even family for the first week. And I sat and stared out that little itty bitty tiny window for about three days. Still didn't want to shower. Um, it's horrible. So when you come in, you can't read, you're not drinking. They take not you, drinking. How about the pain meds? Are you off the pain meds at this point? Off the pain meds at this point. They they weren't giving me anything whatsoever except what I needed for my bipolar disorder. Mm -hmm. It's the only thing they would let me have. Mm -hmm. um, and they would not let me take it the way I wanted to take it. Um, for me, I had to take mine with food or I'd be sick. Eight o'clock every morning. You didn't eat till nine. So, sick or not, you're taking it at eight. If you're sick, you're sick. Mm -hmm. If you don't eat, you don't eat. It is what it is. We don't even care. Nope. You're just a number. Yep. Yep. And that was it. And second weekend, my husband was allowed to come in and bring me a couple items. And Anna came with him. And that was horrible. It, it was horrible to be sitting there and have your daughter come into a psych ward to see you. And it just ripped me apart. And, and you got to stay there for two weeks and sit in front of a panel and answer all these questions before they'll let you out. And again... Four years of psychology, when I went to sit in front of that panel, I'd been, you know, I'd been sober. No alcohol, nothing but my bipolar meds for two weeks. Just thinking a lot clearer. Sat down in front of that panel. And one of them was my psychiatrist I'd been seeing for a while. And they asked me my questions, and I stared him right in the face and answered every single one of them by the textbook. Right, exactly what they wanted to hear. Exactly what they wanted to hear. And I thought for sure he was going to make me stay. And they let me go the next day. Sent me home. Hmm. I was like, okay, I got it. Piece of cake. So then you're released from there, right? Yeah. And then you come home. How Again, what year is this? How long ago is this? It's been, it's going, it's been 10 years ago. Okay. Ten years, so I got out of the psych ward. Ten years, um, found me a job. Started working outside the house. Mm -hmm. um, just in my mind, it was exactly what I needed. I need to get out, get back to work. That's that's all I could think about. Picked up drinking again, but this time in my mind, I I had control because I hadn't drank for. Two weeks. So I knew I could go two weeks without it. Mm -hmm. So I did social drinking. <laughs> and then it became non-social drinking. Yeah, it starts out as just, I'll just have uh -huh. one a night. And maybe you can skip a day or two yep. and have another one to feel like you got it for now. Yep. And and that's where I was. Um, so then I, I 
you know, I'd spent the last, in between all of that, since I couldn't work, I went back to school. And when I found out I had bipolar disorder, my brain said, if you don't understand it, you can't do anything with it. Um, so I went back to school. Late nights. I, I have an addictive personality. Um, so if I'm, I'm not working, I'm studying. And I realized that I could drink and study and still get straight A's. Huh. So, again. No consequences. No consequences. Got my bachelor's in psychology, mental health. Got my master's, psychology, mental health. Um, still drinking. Work eight, ten hours, come home, study for four or six, nap for three, four hours, get up and do it all over again. Nonstop. Um, so, you know, I got out of the psych board, went back to work, got me another job, working, still continued with my education, um, still drinking. Like, didn't stop me. Mm -hmm. Wasn't as bad. Um, I could control it to a certain point. Uh, if I was having a good day, I might go home and drink one or two. If I was having a bad day, uh, or if I hit a manic spike, six, seven a day, just, just to try to be normal in my mind, be normal. So that's, that's kind of where it, you know, it, it all you know when you're when you're drinking that much it becomes a blur cuz it's it's a dark place your mm -hmm. your brain tells you one thing and if you're still functioning you, you really don't need to remember the bad things cuz i really didn't see that many bad things oh okay the psych ward was a little bad <laughs> right it got bad at that point <laughs> that was bad but again it's not like when you're not having consequences when there's no you know, homelessness or jail or unable to pay your bills or any of those things because you're a functioning addict, you don't really see the consequence. Mm -hmm. And you're not even getting sick for shit's sakes. I mean. Nope. There was no reason for me to quit. So what does bring it all to an end? Like what makes you say, I'm Age. Done. Okay. Um, I think the fact that it's getting harder and harder for me to move, like, I am literally in pain from the time I get up to the time I go to bed. So that was another question, too, is, like, how bad is your body now that all that happened to it? It's, I, I had a span where it wasn't that bad. And now as I get older, it's it's going back. Um, which the doctors told me that it would. You know, the older you get, the harder and harder it's going to be for you to function. Sure. Um, and... We're preparing, you know, my husband, he's wonderful. He's kept the ramp on the front of the house. He'll put a ramp on the side because steps are going to get real hard for me uh -huh. to do. Uh, and that's a struggle knowing that there's going to be a point where I'm going to be back in that situation where I'm right. not going to be as mobile as I am now. Uh -huh. So in the back of my mind, I, I have to keep reminding myself, don't go back there. Because mm -hmm. this is how far you've come. Um, and now you have a grandson. That was huge for me. Um, so every day I have to remind myself when I get up that coffee is my friend. <laughs> mm -hmm. Water makes me feel better. And if I drink a beer now, it makes me sleepy. <laughs> Which... I guess that's my consequence because I don't like to be tired. So it's it's really slow. Now, it's hot outside. I drink a beer. Mm -hmm. One. <laughs> and then I leave it. Um, we go to the river. I may have two or three. But then I have to, I literally spend my entire time saying, this is it. Because you know what happens after this one. Mm -hmm. So it's a it's an everyday battle to make sure that I stay on the path that I want to be on. And 
you know, having a grandson, that was huge. Um, that, that all but completely stopped me. Um, I don't have my memories from Anna's childhood. They're gone. Um, and that's crushing as a parent. So Jack is my, Jack is my way to get those memories. You know, the, the first walk, the first step, the, the baby cuddles, the playing outside, all that stuff that you get with your kid for first time. I'm, I'm literally getting them mentally for the first time with my grandson. So, and I don't want to miss it because mm -hmm. I know what it's like to forget it. So that's so weird to be able to know that you forgot something though. Like for me to think about saying, uh, I want to experience all these things because I know I forgot them, but I, I feel bad because I forgot them. It's kind of hard to put that puzzle mm -hmm. together in my head, right? Yeah. Because I know I don't remember this. I feel bad because I don't remember this. I know I want to remember this, but I don't even know what I'm misremembering. Right. Right. I, I have a box of pictures that my mom left behind from our childhood. And this is excruciating. So I go through those and Mike's memory is really good. Okay. So he's telling really you. good. So I pick a picture and he tells me, he explains that picture to me hmm. and I might get bits and pieces um, or family functions. You know, it's, it, they're really hard because Crystal and Tanya can say, hey, you remember when we were 16 years old and this, this, and this happened? And I'm sitting there quietly because I got nothing. No, I don't remember none of that. I got nothing. Huh. So do you ever just go into it and like lean into it and be like, no, I don't remember that, but tell me all about it because I would like to know what happened that I don't remember. I don't, I, um, I get mad. Okay. Um, yeah, I th it's, I know it's jealousy because they have them and I don't. And I sit and you listen to them fact. laugh. Yeah, you resent that. Yes. And, and it did, it, it drove a wedge between me, Crystal and Tanya. Hmm. Because since they had those memories, they hung out more. With me, right. I pulled away because I didn't want to sit there and listen to them laugh and talk about things we did when we grew up. And hmm. I can't even, oh, yeah, That's that gotta was be hard. fun. That's got to be hard. But have you ever Couldn't thought about trying to look at it the other way and be like, maybe that because I know I have memories from times when I was messed up on whatever it was. And people will tell me about it, what I did, and now it's kind of a memory. Mm -hmm. I don't remember it, but I remember them telling me what I did. Mm -hmm. So you don't think there's like it just snaps you off, and you're like, you know what? I don't want to hear this. It, it did. Um, and about, I'm gonna go say about three years ago. Uh, me, Crystal, and Tanya got into an argument, and I, I provoked it. Um. And I said, I, you know, it's not fair. You don't invite me anywhere. We don't do anything together. When you all go someplace, no one talks about it in front of me. Because they, they didn't want to hurt my feelings. But I think back on it now, and they didn't invite me because when they were inviting me, I was saying no. And I continued to say no. So they, they gave up. And I don't blame them for that. Mm -hmm. You know, at some point, you not ask you anymore. You don't go. Of course. So a couple of years ago, you know, I, it finally clicked that it wasn't all them. It, it was me. Mm -hmm. It was all me. And that, that kind of turns things around a little bit. Um, I started this group and one of the ladies said, uh, isn't your mom's name Rose? I said, yeah, it was. I know your mom. And she, she emails me this two-paragraph thing about my mom and how she knows her. 
And I'm thinking, I, I have no idea who this woman is. None. And she just sent me two paragraphs about my mom that I couldn't remember. And I literally sat and cried. And, and I called her and thanked her. Hmm. I said, you have no idea what you just did giving me that memory. And that's exactly what she did. She gave me a memory. Mm-hmm. So hey, I'm getting there. Um, day by day, just like I tell the people that I work with, you know, baby steps. And it, and it took me a while to start taking my own advice and start taking those baby steps and stop being so angry at people who had the memories that I needed. At no fault of their own, though, Mm-mm. right? You're mad at people for nothing they nothing. did wrong. They did nothing wrong. It was all in my head. So, you know, between that and the fact that my dad was an alcoholic and when he got really bad, um, nobody wants to help an alcoholic. At 62 years old, you're an alcoholic, you're going to die. You know, we're, no, we got better things to do. Mm -hmm. And I thought, you know what? That's not fair. You know, no, nobody wanted to help me, and nobody wanted to help him. And a lot of people can't afford it. Either, either you can't find the right person, or you can't afford it. Because you've gotten so far down that, you know, do I want to pay for somebody to help me, or do I want to pay my bills, try to get back up on my feet? Mm-hmm. You know, what do I want to do? Choices. Mm-hmm. So I decided, you know, through all of this, I thought, I I have a master's in psychology. I have spent 10 years doing nothing but studying the human brain and how people act and why they do the things they do and just absorbing every piece of information I could possibly get my hands on. Well, why am I not using it? (laughs) It just didn't make sense. So... I had a lady tell me once, I'm standing at work, and this this new hire walks up to me and introduces herself. And I said, hey, how are you? And, you know, glad to have you here. She said, do you have a minute? I was like, yeah, I've got tons of minutes. She said, all right. I said, come on, we'll go talk. And we walk in there, and she said, I just need you to know something. I said, okay. I, I, I'm a, I'm a recovering addict. I said, okay. Well, I just needed you to know that. Hmm. I said, okay. You didn't have to share it, but is there something I can help you with? She said, I need this job. I said, okay. She said, I need to be here every day. I said, okay. I said, well, I made your schedule, and I have you here every day. You're off, too. (laughs) Okay. I'll be here. I said, all right. I said, was there anything else you needed to talk to me about? No, I just felt like I could tell you that, and and you wouldn't fire me. I thought, never even crossed my mind. So I had that happen, and that was a little weird because I didn't know her. Mm -hmm. Two weeks later, she comes to me and she said, you got a minute? I said, yeah, sure, come on in. So we're sitting there and she breaks down in my office. Now, I've known this girl two weeks and I've never, I don't know anything about her. But she just seen something in you and she felt she could talk to you. She said, So you there never crying. shared with her that you was an, that you had a. She had no idea. Background. Okay. No idea. Um, and she's sitting there crying and she, she said, I'm struggling. I said, Well, what are you struggling with? I don't, I don't know if I, I just don't know if I can do it. I said, Well, can you give me more specifics? I said, I can't help you if you're not, if you don't give me all of it. She lays her story out. She said, Chris, I can't get up in the mornings. She said, I, I want to go back to using. I'm struggling. 
you know, I'm, I just got my kids back. And all I kept thinking was, why are you telling me these things? <laughs> so she gets done and she says, can you help me? I said, well, sure. What do you need me to do? Can you make sure I'm here every day? I said, what does that mean? She said, if I'm not here by quarter after eight, will you call me? My first thought was, are you kidding me? You're a grown fucking adult. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. And then the other part of me kicked in and said, Absolutely, if that's what it takes. All right, you're reaching out for help right now. It, I'm not gonna. I will call you every morning at eight a quarter after eight if you're not here. Right. And that's what I did. She didn't have a ride. She would call and she'd say, "Chris, I can't come to work today. Why not? I don't have a ride. Where do you live? Oh no, I'm I'm like thirty minutes away. I said, all right, give me about forty. Right. And I'll be there. Let me get everybody started. I'll come get you. Well, no, I don't feel good. I said, we got an agreement. Mm -hmm. And she said, you're right. She said, but I don't feel good. I said, well, get up. Take a shower. You got 40 minutes. I'm going to be there in 40 minutes. All right. Show up at her door 40 minutes. You ready? Yeah. It's okay. Get into work. Talk all the way in. She'd be fine. Never said a word to anybody. She'd work all day long. At the end of the day, she'd look at me and she'd say, thanks for coming to get me this morning. I said, you're welcome. So are we going to be here tomorrow? She said, yes, we'll be here tomorrow. Okay. And one of the employees walked up to me one day and she, she, she said, Chris, I said, what? She said, have you ever noticed that tattoo across your forehead? I said, I have no tattoo on my forehead. She said, yeah, it does. She said, you can't see it. She said, but I think everybody else can see it. I said, well, then what does it say? Mm -hmm. She said, it says, tell me your life story. <laughs> I said, oh, my God, get me a rag. I need to get that off. Right, right. <laughs> It's a tattoo, though, man. It's going to stay there. <laughs> and and that's where it started. I, I, people will randomly come up and just tell me things I don't even ask. Like, there literally is something up there that says, tell me your life story. Okay, so from there, you set up. So, I just, it, it was word of mouth, okay. you know. I had, she told someone else. And then I had that person come talk to me. And then it just kind of accumulated. And and these were girls who were working for, you know, $9 an hour, $10 an hour. They couldn't afford to do anything. They're, they're getting their kids back. They're getting their lives together. Mm -hmm. and they couldn't. And I just decided, what the heck? I got a good paying job. I'm paying my bills. We're comfortable. Why not do it for free? If it helps them and they're seeking me out, that's what I'm supposed to do. So word of mouth, somebody'd come up and say, Hey Chris, you got a minute? Absolutely. Okay, so explain uh explain the same way you did when you first started about what you actually do. So first let me say this. I am not a licensed therapist, psychologist, or counselor. As a personal development life coach, you do not have to carry a license in the state of Virginia. What works for me is the fact that I have a degree in psychology. Um, still don't have to have a license. I just have to let everybody know that I'm not a therapist. I am not a psychologist counselor, not licensed. The difference between what I do as a life coach and what a therapist, 
or a counselor would do is, for me, example, you know, I have my own doctor. Um, your psychologist, your psychiatrist, your therapist will take you where you are now and they will take you backward and they will discuss where you started, where it took you, how it affected you, and how it got to you to where you are today. You'll leave your appointment. They'll fill your prescription or whatever it is they'll do. They won't give you any goals, nothing to think about for your next appointment. Um, but they'll set up your next appointment. You'll go in, you'll sit there, um, and my doctor used to say to me, how you feeling? How's your meds working? What meds are you taking? Do you think they're working? Anything you want to discuss? Uh, these are the meds I'm taking. Yeah, they're working. Not really. Okay. When's my next appointment? Mm -hmm. I only needed to see him to get my, to get my medication. And I knew that. <laughs> mm -hmm. So that's what they do. That's that's what I'm saying. I think, yeah. Yeah. Same thing coming to my head too. It's that medical circle of you need meds. You got to come see me to get them. I get paid when you come and see me. The pharmacy yep. gets paid when you come and see me. Yep. You get your pills. And, and you get 15 you minutes. Do it all again. 30 minutes max. It's nothing that's working on goals for your life or how to change things. It's medicate you, shut you up. Yep. Like giving a kid a phone. Yep. So, and that's what they do. I mean, yes, they have really good aspects, and I have my own. Um, but you got to have one in order to get medicated, and I know from experience I need medication. Mm -hmm. um, but that's it. I, I still go in. Yes, my meds are working. Yes, I'm taking them. No, I don't have anything I want to talk about in the next five minutes that I'm allotted before the next patient. Gather the next payment. That's it. So you want to offer the other side of that. You you get down and dirty. You get empathetic and and talk to people. Yes. Um, I have a really strange gift that scares the shit out of me. Um that I learned about, Whew. I take people from, I have a form that people fill out and it tells me, um, it tells me you, your name, where you want to go, where you're at, why you think you're there, any struggles that you have. Um, it tells me about your family. Um, you can add information at the bottom, but most of my questions are on my form are all based on, okay, you are at point A. Tell me what point A looks like. When you get further down, I need you to tell me what point B looks like. In your mind, what does point B look like? So they fill that out. And then they give it to me. And I go over it, take notes, write down what I think is going on and how I think you can get from point A to point B. Difference, I don't set your goals. You set your goals. Mm -hmm. I hold you accountable to your goals. So if you look at me and say, you know, Chris, six months from now, I want to not be so stressed. Uh, I want a work-life balance. Three things. And, and I tell people, don't pick more than three. You're weighing, you're setting yourself up for failure. And it becomes overwhelming. Yep. Three things. Don't make them big. Baby steps. Because you can change them and pick three more a week from now if you want. Then I offer them um, 90 minutes of what we call our discovery session, and it's free. You get 90 minutes of my time for free. We sit down with that form. We go through it, and I tell you what I see, and then we sit down together and we decide what you want your goals to be. You tell me. I ask you 
questions that make you think about those goals, how are you going to get there? How do you see yourself getting there? What do you think your obstacles are going to be as we move forward? And you give me all that information. And then I hold you accountable for the information that you've given me. Chris, I would like to get up every morning at 6 o'clock, do yoga for 20 minutes, jump in the shower, go to work, be at work 15 minutes early, and every day I want to leave at 4.30 like I'm supposed to instead of leaving at 6 o'clock. Fair enough. Write them down. They write them down. Okay, now we need a plan. So let's take one section at a time. What's your plan to get from here to here? They tell me what their plan is. All right, and it might be transportation. It might be how you climb the ladder to get mm -hmm. more money. Yep. But it's setting goals. Yes, and then I hold them accountable to those goals. So if you're setting them, then my job is to make sure, one, you're setting realistic goals and that when you decide on the path to get to that goal, that it's at a realistic right. path. Um, and it's detailed. You can't just say, I want to get up every morning at 6 o'clock. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, yeah, you. Let's get up at 6 o'clock. Right. But it's more of a game plan. It's like we're trying to make a touchdown. I can't just say mm -hmm. I want to go make a touchdown. Here's all the plays that are going to happen in order for me to make the touchdown. Yes. And it has to be specific. Because if I'm going to hold you accountable, when you come to the next session, I am going to use what you gave me. And I'm going to say, Did here you? is where you all wanted right. to be at this session. Where are you? Well, I, I didn't make it. Okay, fair enough. Did, didn't expect it to happen in two weeks, month. What do we need to change? Where do you think it broke down? All right. And then when you have that itemized plan, you can go through and pick specific things that are not working, right? Yep. Makes perfect sense. And you may have to change it. You know, I have a young lady that I've been working with for the past year. And she set goals based on two good weeks that she had. So she changed her goals. And she said, I did this for two weeks. I felt so much better. Mm -hmm. I said, okay, good. She said, can I change them? I said, they're yours. You can do whatever you want. I'm just going to hold you accountable for them. Okay, this is what we're going to do. She lays it all out. We go through the whole entire process. Two weeks later. I didn't do any of it. I said, okay, why? I stayed up late. Why did you stay up late? I don't know. Okay, I don't know is not an answer in my book. <laughs> no, what were you doing? Watching did, TV, reading a book? You're you have to be more phone? specific. Yeah. You know, I stayed up all night watching Netflix. Okay, five whys. Why'd you stay up all night watching Netflix? It's not a, oh, okay, well, you're up watching Netflix for an extra four hours. I have to figure out why you stayed up four hours longer watching Netflix. So it takes the five whys to figure out why they did it. For this young lady, she had stayed up four extra hours. She had a really bad day that day. And her mind was racing. She couldn't sleep. First thing in the morning, she had something that happened during her day that threw her completely off for the rest of the day. So we didn't need to deal with the Netflix. We needed to deal with what happened that morning. And it takes some questions to get there. So that's what I do. Cause and effect, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hmm. So I have learned to, to break things down into little tiny pieces so that you know why you did that 
and what kept you from getting there so that we can create a different path, one that is more reasonable based on worst case scenario or somebody throws a monkey wrench in. Now what do you do? Let let's practice that. Mm-hmm. So basically you're 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 filling the toolbox with tools. Are you like giving them this outline of your, you know, your daily okay, this is our goal, here's how we're gonna obtain it. And like do you have like a format that I you're do. handing over and saying this is how you fill these forms out and if you go by the form it works mm-hmm. like thing? I do. Um I specifically design every package or every session based around the individual. Um, I don't, it's not a one size fits all. You do have some coaches who will, oh, you want to work on stress management here? Take this workbook. Uh I do a discovery for 90 minutes because I literally customize every session based on the last. Um, Takes a little longer but it's more effective. Um, So when you come to me and you say, this didn't work, I put all of my notes, I have a coaching platform. And every time I get a new client, I I create them their own portal that only that person and myself have access to. I send them all their notes. I send them copies of what they created is going to happen goal wise, what they're going to do, how they're going to do it. You know, it could be very, very detailed from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. Or it could be, you know, first four hours of my day might be larger in the beginning. Right. And you just got to shrink it. Um, send all of it to them. Here's what we talk about. Here's what you said you were going to do. Here's your time frame. Here's our next appointment. Here's your told. Um, here's your goals, your tasks. This is how many they get points if they achieve them. Um, this is how many points you get one for each ones uh-huh. that you complete. Uh-huh. See you at the next session. If you have any questions, type it into the portal. Come straight to my email so we can talk through that portal if we need to. If they get confused, they have questions, I send them activities that they have to have done between sessions. I don't overwhelm them. You know, you might only get one activity, um, and you have to have that activity done before the next session. And I create that activity, and it is in your portal two days after you leave, and all of it set out in a time frame with instructions right, for you to be able to go look at it if you need to at any point mm-hmm. and they can mark it as done complete in progress they can put everything in the portal all their notes mm-hmm. download all of their activities all of it when they get done it's there they fill it out it'll just pop up on my screen and i can see it um they don't want to share it they want to keep personal notes They can block that and keep their notes and only share them when they want to. It's it's their portal. Mm -hmm. But it's our window in between um, to make sure they're staying on task. Right. And it's way more uh, Mm one-on-one than what it is with people that are just counting numbers. Yep. So how many people do you think this has worked for at this point? Like, do you have a... Here's uh, examples of people that have have gone from zero to something. I have currently within the last, it's a lot to keep track of. Um, I say in the last 10 years, at least 30, which doesn't really seem like a whole lot when you do 10 years. Mm. It, it seems like a really small number. Um, But the process, most life coaches, when they start out, will say, I'll give you six months. If we haven't done anything in six months, it's not going to work. Because it's it's hard work. You You have to be just as dedicated 
as I am, if not more so, for it to work. So a lot of life coaches will say, I will give you six months. After that, if we're not making any progress, maybe I'm not it. Or maybe you're not ready. Mm. And and they they just give up. Right. Stop wasting my time yeah. and stop wasting your money type deal. Right. Um, I'm not like that. If we get three months in and I'm not seeing progress, either I'm doing something wrong, which is usually the first route I go. Maybe I haven't been specific enough. Maybe I haven't given the right activity. Maybe we've not been honest enough that I don't have all the information. Right. And that's what's slowing us down. But I'm not going to... I'm not going to give up. Basically, you feel like your formula is right. As long as everything's filled in properly, we should be able to come up with a solution. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's I'm personalizing based on what you are giving me. Mm -hmm. And I always say up front, um, honesty. You have to promise me honesty because that's exactly what you're going to get from me. And, and it's going to be hard work. It's going to be painful at times. You are not going to like me at times, and that's okay. Uh, just don't quit on me. I'm not always going to be the coach you want, but I will be the coach you need until we get through the journey. And so far, that's worked. Um, I've not had, I've probably had three people give up on me, um, and that's been... They've gotten to a point where it, it got hard and they had to make um, decisions where they had to give something up that they weren't really, they weren't ready to give up, even if it made a huge impact. And I can't force you to make that change. I can only tell you based on what you've given me what that change looks like. So either you want it or you don't. Right. Right. <clears throat> if they're coming to you, though, they should be at, at that point where they're ready to change up. Yes. It's it's when it gets difficult is when people kind of mm -hmm. sit and go back and forth. Mm -hmm. I'm really clear up front. You know, we sit in that 90 minutes. I, I'm really clear up front and I've been told I'm a little harsh, but I think it's fair that if I'm going to take you down a journey that at some point is going to be painful, you should know that up front. Yeah, and you should be prepared for pain because life is pain. Yeah, and I don't want to sugarcoat it. I don't want to look at you and say, oh, this is going to be a piece of cake. You know, I can get mm -hmm. you there in mm -hmm. six months. We just need to do this, this, and this. You might have a bad day, but... Mm -hmm. You'll be fine. That, that's lying. <laughs> that's just flat out lying. So, yeah, you know, there's people give up. Um, and I get it. I mean, I did it a lot. So I, I don't take it personally. I don't also don't give up. I usually wait about two or three months and I send a text or a email or something just Hey, how you doing? Mm -hmm. Anything I can help you with? You need anything? Right, still here. Still here. Still here, willing to put you I never shut the, the door. I never shut the door. No matter how badly it ends, I never shut the door because I've been there. Mm -hmm. And if somebody had shut the door on me, I wouldn't be here. So I, I can't, I can't bring myself to do it. Um. And one of my curses is that when I get wrapped up, and I say it's a curse, it may not, it's probably not. When I get wrapped up with someone and I, and I see them start to make progress, I can feel it. Like, literally, I can feel it. And when they come in, they can look at me and they can say, Chris, I've had a really good day today. It's like, yeah, tell me about it. 
And it's like something inside of me, like my, there's a gut feeling that I'm not sure that's a true statement. It's almost like they're tired and they've come in and they're tired. And the phrase, I've had a really good day, means don't talk to me. <laughs> right. Just let me sit here and tell you it was a good day and then get up and leave. And, uh, don't ask me no questions. Right. Back to you answering the questions in the psych board the way you knew they wanted to hear them. Mm -hmm. They all learn to do that. Yep. They Here's a saying, and, and I've been talking about it. Um, I have a private face group page for all women. Um, three months, I went to 650 women from everywhere. I went to talk to a, a lady a few weeks ago, and she looked at me, and she said, what you see is what you get. And I said, that's a true statement. But only on certain days. And it is a true statement. You only, what you see is what you get. Today. So if I want you to see me happy, that's what you see. Mm -hmm. If I'm having a bad day and I want to share that with you, that's what you see. Yeah. So a lot, a lot of people say that. Yeah, you're only going to let people in to where you want to let them in, though, mm -hmm. right? That's it. Yeah, we're going to draw that line or set that wall up wherever we want to set that wall up. I still do that to this day. We all do. I still do that. Um, I hate questions. I hate people asking me questions about shit that I feel like I don't care about telling me about. Yeah. So what did you have to eat? Does it matter? I'm full. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? Yes. Like, you know what I mean? I go out to do something. And he's like, oh, yeah, was, was it fun? Like, yeah, man. That's why I went. I don't know. And that's the asshole in me sometimes. But sometimes I just don't like answering questions. Yeah. I, I'm not super interested in those things, I guess, that they're asking me about. Like, if you was talking, I'm never going to ask you what you had to eat. I yeah. don't care what you had to eat. I just don't care. So when you ask me, bro, I'm just like, why do you care about that? And I think that's kind of why it is because I'm interested in a lot of stuff, but there's certain things that just like, I don't care. So when you ask me, I'm like, why would you care about that? That's so weird. And Did you cut your toenails say, today? No, I cut my toenails three days ago. <laughs> <laughs> so weird. I don't understand. <laughs> and it's weird that you say that because people think, oh, you sit and talk to people all the time. Mm-hmm. You probably want to hear about this or ask this question. And people will come up and say, so, Chris, what do you think about? And and I have one of those faces that says, before I open my mm -hmm. mouth. Me too. I could give two shits mm -hmm. about what this conversation is going to be about. Can we just do the short version? <laughs> <laughs> or ask me something else because yeah, I, I don't want to do it. Right. I've gotten to the point where I'm just like, you know what, bro? I don't want to talk about that. Let's just move on to something else. Or like I'll even put it out there. Or, or I'll be a smart ass most of the time and be like, oh, great story. Got another? <laughs> like I don't care. Or my favorite one is, you know what this is? It's my care face, bro. <laughs> yep. I don't care. So I got a couple questions here I want to ask. Um, every one of them that probably has something to do with what's going on. You have the option to pass. So if any of them come up that you don't like, just pass them. Okay. Um, can you describe how alcohol made you feel? Like when you got that feeling that it, you were shooting for, how would you describe it? Um, alcohol made me feel normal. And in my eyes, the alcohol made me feel normal because there were no racing thoughts. There was no depression. Hmm. There was no consequences. So that was my normal when I was drinking. Hmm. Uh, so what was the lowest point during your addiction to alcohol? My lowest point. Um Ooh, having my 10-year-old daughter have to walk into a psych ward to visit me. That's the 
was painful. Very painful. Rock bottom? That was my bottom. Okay, so let's see. If you could specify one thing that you regret most that you did or that happened during your addiction, what would that be? Being that person when my daughter was in her teenage years because I missed a whole lot um, during her teenage years and I affected her mentally in a way that I wholeheartedly believe, even though she is a very strong young woman, she struggles with the person that I was. And I think that that hurt her in a way I'm never going to be able to take that back or fix it. Ever. Hmm. It was probably irrelevant. What was the worst thing you did during active addiction? Thankfully, I'm glad I can't remember all of it. I'd say the worst part was probably before the accident. So I don't remember a whole lot of it. Um, if any. After the accident, um, I would have to say the way I treated my husband was horrible. I, uh, I have no idea why he's still here. Like, I, 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 don't, I have no idea why he did not divorce me and leave me. I was horrible. I was destructive. I, I couldn't clean the house. I couldn't do the laundry. I wouldn't go nowhere with him. I, I was... I was horrible. Like, I didn't even want to be around me. <laughs> I don't know how he did it. I really don't. Crazy, right? Stronger people than us sometimes stick around with us. Thank God. Yeah, no doubt about that. What would you say is the most important lesson that you learned from addiction? For me, um, I'm thankful for the lessons. I'm thankful for bits and pieces because they brought me where I'm at now. Ask me that question again. Ask okay. me that question again. So what do you do every day to help you stay clean? What do you do? Like, cause alcohol is everywhere, right? So you're going mm -hmm. in the stores, you're seeing alcohol. Every time you go in a store, go out to eat. What do you do to not drink, to not fall back into that? I work. But I gave up alcohol addiction for work addiction. I work my nine to five job and then I do my life coaching on top of it. And I study. And I spend time with my family, and I treasure every minute of it now because it's, it's the most important things I've got. So basically, you just stay busy. You don't do meetings or anything like that, though? Did them. Mm -hmm. I, did, I did the meetings. Evidently, I wasn't ready because I found them more entertaining than helpful because I was a smart ass. Mm -hmm. um, but no, I, my family supports me. Um, you know, I, I still, on occasion, I have that beer. 
but they look at me and remind me that that one is all I can Right, have. enjoy yourself now, but you're not going to get away with this that for very it. long. Right, I'm going to hold you accountable, right. Yep. Huh. So what was the last straw? What was the final straw that just put the nail in the coffin? You said, dude, I can't do it no more. I can't drink every day. Just can't do it. Um. The biggest would have been um, Anna, Anna's face when uh, we were talking about it one day, and she said, "Mom, do you re do you remember anything?" I said, "Not really." She said. You know, you just, you weren't there. And she was right. I I wasn't there. I, I was not there at all. And she was angry with me. Very angry with me. And being an only child and her and I being so close, that hurt bad. And, and then when Jack came I could still hear Anna and I's conversation when uh, when I found out Jack was coming, and all I kept saying is, "Damn you! You can't fuck this one up because you might not get another chance. <laughs> so don't do it again." And and her saying that stuck with me, and. said jack came and i i don't want to mess it up not twice i feel hmm. like he gave me a second chance right and even though the memories you lost aren't something you even know about there's a regret there mm -hmm. that you don't want to feel again absolutely i'm curious how that's going to work with me for my grandkids because uh I really wasn't there for them being, you know what I mean? I wasn't a father. I just wasn't. I was a drug addict. I was in prison. It was selfish me all the time. I've wondered how the grandkid things are going to be like, and am I worthy? You know, because I worry about that as well. I, I think that's the way we all feel at some point. Am I worthy after everything I've done? Am I? But then, if we weren't, I don't think we'd get the second chance. Right. And that's what I keep telling myself. If it was that bad, you wouldn't get that second chance. Hmm. Hmm. So this is one of my favorite ones. If you could go back to a specific time or day and talk to yourself and give yourself some advice. Would you? And if so, what would you say? <sighs> you know, it's a tough one because everything I did in my past got me to where I'm at now. And where I'm at now helps so many people that I don't regret all of it. Um, my regret is hurting my husband and my daughter. So I think if I could go back, I probably most definitely. The day I came out of the psych ward, I... I'd have never touched another drop of alcohol. It is probably one of my biggest wishes is that I've never gone back. That's a hard one, isn't it? Because a part of me is I'm the same way. Like I am who I am, and, and today I'm proud of who I am. Mm -hmm. But if I could go back and save my kids and my mother – and those people, all the heartache that I put on them through my actions, I would go back in a heartbeat. 
Yep. And I don't care what would happen to me after that. Like, I would take that risk just so I could pull that back. And they're proud of me today, all the things that come along with. So that's a very hard question, isn't it? It is because, you know, Anna, Anna told me when, when I said, you know what, I'm, it's time for me to start doing life coaching as a career, not just a side job. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be really, really hard to start that business. Um, and she said, uh, she said, mom, I am really proud of you. She said, I know you're working long hours. She said, but you still make time for family. She said, but I am, I am really proud of you. And I have never heard those words from her. So I, yeah, if I could take the pain right. away from her and my husband, absolutely. But in the same token, like you said, it, it put us where we're at. Makes you who you are, man. It's definitely a tough one for sure. So I think this is a good one for you, too, because of, of your background and your education. So, in your opinion and experience, why can't people just turn it off? Why can't we just turn addiction off? Just stop using, they say. Why can't we just do that? How come it's not that simple? It's not that simple for a couple reasons. Um, addiction causes the brain. So, our pleasure comes from our dopamine. When you have an addiction... Um, regardless of what it is, it, it takes the place of that dopamine. So if you're constantly saying to your brain, I don't need your dopamine, I have my own. It's just in a different form. That part of your brain says, fine, I'm not going to produce it. If you're going to get it from alcohol or drugs or wherever you're going to get it from, I'm not making it no more. You're on your own. We need that. That's our that's our happy happy part of our mm -hmm. brain. Um, so when we deplete that, and it the brain will no longer make it, it decides it's not going to make it. Then the only option we have is our addiction, in order to maintain what we consider our happy. Um, so when we stop the dopamine will will start to come back but we've depleted it so much that when it starts to come back it gives us that really fast happy and we don't know what to do with it because we are not controlling it we have control issues <laughs> yeah we want to turn it on and off yes and we can't. Yeah, that's what the pills, the drugs, the whatever does. Turns it and, off, turns it on. Turns it off, turns it on. All right. And I think we could also associate that with uh, games and technology, right? Yes. Because those things are just as addictive as yes. heroin or cocaine. It sets off the same exact same. receptors in the brain. Mm -hmm. And we're giving that shit to our kids when they're three or four years old. Yep. That scares me for the future. Yes. You're teaching kids. And things that they can supplement that dopamine that is supposed to be a naturally reoccurring thing from you doing something productive and getting satisfaction from it. Correct. But instead, we flip our phone, play a game, put some in our arm, put some down our throat. I think yep. that's scary. Every Everything, whether it's drug, it's video games, work, you know, work is an addiction. Mm -hmm. Chocolate, food. Chocolate, food. We, we are replacing that natural dopamine in our brain with something else. And then when we stop doing it, the brain says, oh, my gosh, I haven't produced this in so long. And then it, it starts to throw it in there. And we're like, oh, mm -hmm. shit, what is that? So we have that's where your fight or flight comes mm -hmm. in. You know, do I do I take in that dopamine and say, okay, let me learn to process this naturally, let it let it happen, or do I go back to where I was more comfortable? And also, there's a I feel like there's the uh, f 
drugs gets me whatever it is immediately. And if I'm doing the other things, then uh, it takes a little bit of work most of the time. It's not as simple. Like, at first, it's like all I'm doing is this dope and it gets me high. And then later on, there's work to get to the dope. Right. But the work that you're supposed to get from building a house or, or satisfyingly taking care of your family is supposed to be that same dopamine release, right? Correct. So that's kind of why I named the channel what it is. Spanking Monkeys is because we always go after that dopamine. Mm -hmm. the 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 beeline to whatever makes us feel good because we're savages we're fucking apes yeah. at heart we're apes we're monkeys yep that's what we are we just want to feel good yep. that can be sex porn games uh, heroin cocaine alcohol chocolate anything that's quick anything we that gets us what we want now yep because we don't want to work for it yep we want it's it now the human nature scary as shit so uh, I guess from there like. What is your message to people? What would your mission statement be? If you had a mission statement, this is what I want to do. This is who I am. What would that be? As a personal development and self-care life coach for women, what I want to do is I want to offer women the resources that they need to understand that as women, we do not have to go through life stressed all the time. We don't have to go through life with anxiety going through the roof. We don't have to find and stay on that path of any type of addiction, regardless of what it is. Um, it's okay for us to look at somebody and say, I'm tired and I need help. I, I don't want to carry the world on my shoulders anymore. I'm powerful and mm -hmm. I can do it. Mm -hmm. But I'm at a point now where this is who I want to be. And in order for me to get there, I need help. We just have to learn to ask for help. And I can do that. I mean, you just heard me. I didn't, I didn't, wasn't born with a silver spoon in my mm -hmm. mouth. And I most definitely I didn't get it easy. <laughs> that's another big part of it, too, is I've had a lot of people say they don't like talking to counselors and people that haven't been through it. Mm -hmm. Because they look right at them and judge them and say, you don't know shit about me. Mm -hmm. You've never felt the way I feel. Yep. So with that, too, you know how that is. Where can people find you? Like uh, main social media, email, anything like that? So I'm on Facebook. Um, Christina Wampler Cook. That's my I'll that's put my that public. in the title for sure. I also have a website. Mm -hmm. uh, www.christinacooklifecoach.com mm -hmm. um, and then for all the women I have a um, personal development and self-care warriors Facebook page it's private, all women uh, support, encourage a lot of educational information on there all the channels point you to my website and on my website the link points you to my coaching platform. That way it's all private. Uh, people don't know that you're clicking or, you know, sending me messages. For all they know, you're clicking on a website to look at buying mm -hmm. something from Amazon. Right. Blogs on there for them to, to read. Uh, comment areas for them to let me know, you know, hey, I could, you got anything about this topic? Right, okay. Uh, and I put that on my website. So that they can go there. Um, but a lot of to the www.christinacooklifecoach.com, that website has everything on there um, to get whatever it is you need resources, uh, information, contact me to sit and, and talk for, you know, 90 minutes and let me let me help you plan out where you want to go. And in and, and all honesty, I will say this. If you come to me and you tell me a story and I think you need to see a psychiatrist mm -hmm. and it is out of my realm, I am going to straight up look you in your face and say, mm, you need to see a psychiatrist. Right. You need more help than I could provide. I, am, I do not take on anything that is not within my training and my education or my life experience. I don't think it's fair. Mm -hmm. it, I'm, it's not fair. Right. 
But that, uh, as soon as I heard that that was like a resource that you was part of, that's that, that was my main draw for having you is because of the resource that you provide. I didn't even know about your addiction. We've never mm-hmm. talked about that before, and we've spent hours together. Yeah. Um, so I think that's interesting. I'm glad that it come together that way. Me too. Me too. Right. Anything else you would want to say before we take off? Thank you. It's kind of like a weight. All right. <laughs> Feels good? Feels good. Good. It's comfortable in here, right? It's just it chill. Is. There's like, you know, you can't really tell the cameras are on you. Mm-hmm. You're just kind of doing your thing other than the super bright microphones. Yeah. I mean, no, it's very comfortable. Sweet. All right, so, man, she kept it real. She offered a lot of resources out there. I know a lot of chicks been watching this. Y'all have been reaching out to me and, and telling me that you've been watching it. So uh, if, if if Christine is someone that can help you or help someone you know, like she just listed a ton of resources to help people right here, man. And I think that's what this is all about. We want people to not use if, if that's the possibility. But if you are using and you need a way out of it, there's places to go. There's help everywhere. So, you know. Click the like button. Subscribe if you're not subscribed, man. Hit the comments. You know, if you want to talk to Christina, she told you where you can contact her. So thanks for watching. I appreciate y'all being here.